I made this almost like a Sesame Street like 98 minute documentary where I tried to explain certain concepts and why I think some of them are still important and some were probably lost. Uh, but that were the two films before that. And now I made two horror films in a row, which is uh, strange. But I mean, I have to say I like horror films because if you look back in the history of filmmaking, horror films were always were a very early in adopting interesting like aesthetic techniques or 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 they like horror films were always very creative uh or 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 did things that then became uh like aesthetic like tropes or things in other uh, formats, but but the horror films did it first. Austrian artist, filmmaker, and writer Johannes Grinsbergner returns to the Plutopia podcast. We explore social media and mass media in the U.S. and Europe. We also compare U.S. and European politics. And Johannes explains cocktail robots, horror films, and his latest feature film, Razen Nest. Hey, everybody! Welcome to. The latest episode of the Plutopia News Network podcast. And uh, Scoop Sweeney, my partner in crime, is here with me. And we're two confused old men. And our guest today is our old friend Johannes Grinsferdner, who's an Austrian artist, a filmmaker, a writer, an actor, a curator, a theater director, a performer, and a lecturer and the founder, conceiver, and artistic director of Monochrome, oh. an international art and theory group. <laughs> and Monochrome was a whole lot like my old company, Fringeware, except Fringeware only lasted six or seven years, but Monochrome is still jamming away after, what, three decades? Look what I have for you. Hot dog. You know, I've got a complete set back here behind me. Yeah. I, I found like I, I I looked into the archives and I found like two or three copies and I thought like the the are you wired one is especially nice because first of all like not even wired is super relevant anymore and can anyone still remember are you serious you know it's just like <laughs> well he remembers himself I know that actually he just released uh, some new music under the Mondo Vanilli nomen oh, yeah. uh, nomenclature. No, no, yeah. I, I invited him to to give a talk at one of our conferences because so one of the things that we do at, at uh, Monochrome is we organize a couple of festivals or conferences. One we will talk about in detail a little bit later because we are bringing it to, to Austin. And another festival we did a couple of years in uh, San Francisco is the festival for sex and technology and we called it ARS, like A-R-S-E, ARS Electronica. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, I'm so, so sorry I missed that. Yeah, uh, and so we're, we're still doing it. We're not doing it in San Francisco anymore because it is unfucking believably expensive. Like, yes! I can, I can, I, that, that, what, that's what San Francisco is doing to me, that face. And, yeah. uh, uh, so, so we stopped having to do it because it's it's a great place, you know. It's very sex positive, and all the nerds are around and stuff like that. So we thought it's a perfect location for doing a sex tech conference, and we did it between 2007 and 2015, and then we couldn't afford it anymore. So we are doing it now as a traveling show in different other uh, countries and, and and cities. But uh, I think. Uh, I can't remember what year it was, but we had Are You Serious at the conference. And he was talking about sex and technology and uh, transhumanism, of course. Uh, of course, yeah. 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 So still don't get it. Uh, 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 transhumanism? So, I mean, well, it's just, uh, yeah, you know, we could live it, to it. Not. With all they say is we could live forever ever if we just didn't die. Exactly. Or if we just exactly. wanted to, but a lot of people don't yeah, want to. Yeah, you kind of get tired of it commitment. after a while, I guess. But I don't it, know. It's, I'm it's, not tired it's of it yet. Like, <laughs> it's, it's, like, uh, it's like Christian philosophy or teleology without the Christian stuff. It's just like, okay, <laughs> so we want to go to heaven. Like, how can we make that work with 
technology and but it's it's also it has this like strange idea of that you can actually separate the mind from the body and they're they're and that is super christian or this is this is very like Thomas well, yeah. is something that you can take that that there that there's a difference that there's a boundary between mind and matter or something like that but there i don't know but yeah the idea that you could upload your mind into a computer and that it would still be you which yeah. is uh, you know Debatable. as far as i'm concerned pretty much impossible but yeah yeah. It's it's a it's a good science fiction trope, I guess, and and it I think is, yeah. part of the problem is that we've been exposed to so much science fiction for so long that we're starting to believe a lot of the bullshit that is, you know, unlikely if not probably impossible. Yeah, and like, uh, I'll be like like Howard Rheingold, who probably eats like uh, twenty pounds of pills every day <laughs> to. to to get all the nutrients <laughs> so he can live forever. Well, what, what is Howard Rheingold actually doing? Is he doing anything besides... He's making things? art. He's hanging out at home making art. Okay. Yeah, you know, that's that was his first love, was art, you know. Yeah. Painting things, painting his shoes. You've seen his painted shoes, haven't you? Uh, yes, I have. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's Amazing works of yeah. art. Yeah, he's... Uh, it, is, it is fun to see, like, how all the people who came out of this, like, late 80s early 90s you know like techno utopian background you know like are you serious and howard Rheingold, the guys who started wired all these people uh like uh jared lanier and all these guys what 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 they are doing right now or, or how they changed in their philosophy so i mean jared lanier is now like the complete opposite uh philosophically of, of what he did in the early 90s and it's 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 interesting to see the the the, the grad, gradual changing of like how how those early uh kind of like optimists uh is going on yeah yeah i mean there's been a lot lately to kill our optimism i guess yeah but yeah, a um, lot of people are just uh turned off by what has really happened to the tech scene. It's been taken over by the so-called tech bros who yeah. have a whole different set of values than uh, were present in the original incarnation of all the technology yeah. uh, fanaticism. I mean, they're, they're all trying to be Steve Jobs's, but, but, but kind of like on hyperdrive, as if like Steve Jobs wouldn't already have been hyperdrive, but <laughs> it, it, it gets worse, it seems. <laughs> a lot of people have just become basically creatures of sales and marketing, which yeah. is something I'm real focused on now. I think, you know, the politics of the moment uh, is it's all about money and it's all about making money through political outrageousness, yeah. you know, yeah. kind of selling your ideology. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's this great text that Richard Barbrook and, and what's the other guy's name? Cameron. They wrote this uh, manifesto in the mid '90s, and they're like classic, like British, you know, like leftists, like Marxists. Yeah. But it's it, it's a great it's a great manifesto. It's called the Californian Ideology, where they try to analyze. I hadn't thought about that in years. Yeah, and it's still a good text. I mean, some parts are just like feel a little bit dated, but the basic the basic assumption that that something weird will happen if you take like hippie dom and hyper capitalism and you put it together. And that becomes an ideology, uh, like you see with Steve Jobs and, and characters like like him. That, yeah, at the time he wrote it, it was a critique of the dot com yeah. sort of neoliberal movement that was starting to emerge, and uh, a lot of that was just about money and marketing. Yeah, yeah. Even though we had, you know, we had the open source and free software movements and that sort of thing, but they even sort of got wrapped up in the same sort of strive to if you were trying to to make money you were at least trying to get attention and it's all always been about marketing and yeah. scoop and i have been we have really mastered the art of not getting attention <laughs> quite successful actually you know? but you know uh, just, the whole you're, problem you're, that you're, happened you're like your, your temporary well, autonomous zone of not being seen yeah <laughs> Yeah, the whole marketing thing uh, has kind of got, spun out of control. Uh, you know, even here in Austin, Austin used to be a, a affordable, but now it's uh, 
become not affordable unless you, you know, own a, uh, a big tech stock uh, portfolio or if you own the tech companies. Uh, otherwise, you have to live out in the country somewhere. Like Scoop. Yeah, that's what I did. <laughs> and I guess I'm kind of, I'm not out in the country, but I'm off in a little suburb. Yeah, suburban South Austin is a, it's a separate country from uh, Austin yeah. downtown. <laughs> One of the things I wanted to point out here, though, is Johannes, you come from a small town, right? Oh, yes, I do. I do. And spent a lot of time living on a farm and that sort of thing. And Scoop and I are both from a small town in Texas, the same small town. We actually knew each other when we were kids. And uh, I, I have noticed that there's a lot of people who they grew up in small towns, but they were exposed to mass media. So it was like you were rural and urban kind of at the same time. And Many of those people became weird, you know, sort of, I don't know, artists and, and creatives kind of like us, you know, and things like fringewear and monochrome were kind of about that, about you could reach those people through media uh, and that was evolving. We so I was uh, 10 years in 85. And so I kind of grew up with uh, stories like Neuromancer and, and Robocop that came out in seven. So, so my childhood was at the same time, like looking backward because I was a big fan of the moon landing and all that stuff. So I was looking at, at American pop culture, culture as something great and something inspirational. And of course, uh, but at the same time, it was also something that was very critical. So. I mean, you can't watch Terminator without getting the message of like, don't fuck all of this up, you know, or, or Robocop is a super interesting, ironic take on like Reaganomics and where that will take us if we just like let it, let it, let it flow, you know, which we and, probably have done. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, like the only, the only thing that is not happening is Robocop itself like if you take if you take the storyline of robocop everything came true besides robocop and that's also like in the making you know yeah and yeah so, exactly so but it was i was also like 11 years old when the challenger explosion happened so at the same time i was kind of like in, in in the middle of like techno utopianism and techno pessimism and uh so so when i started being online and that was pretty early i think i got my first modem when i was like 12 or 13 so 87 or 88 and it was on the fidonet and that was super interesting for me because i grew up in a small town uh where my so my my parents home is uh in stockerau which is like back then 12,000 people now it's 15,000 people so very small but most of the time I was in this like little hamlet outside of Stockerau where my grandparents lived. And that's a hamlet of like 1,200 people. And so that's where I built my tree houses and all that stuff. So at the same time, I was outside doing things with yourself, tree houses. But I was also online and could write emails and people in San Francisco would answer me when I had questions about uh, science fiction books or something like that. So in that kind of strange dichotomy of kind of like like rural area that that you mentioned yeah but also connected to the infosphere or whatever we called it back then that was something very strange and also very liberating to me because i mean most people that i knew also close friends they weren't really nerdy you know they were not interested in the things that I wanted to talk about. They wanted to play soccer or something, and I wasn't that good in soccer. So so that that shaped me, yeah. And and out of that, monochrome happened because just a couple of years later, when I was like 16, 17, I decided I would like to do like a fanzine. First it was like a message board on Fidonet, and then it became a, a fanzine to reach other people. And I started like collecting other fanzines like like fringeware, etc. And, and you was, joined the fringeware list, right? Oh, exactly. The yes, email yes. list. And uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, so, so, and, and what I realized super early, and I was also like part of uh, Antifa back then, and very political as 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 a teenager, like like pr 
probably less political than I am today, but but I, I was definitely political. Well, I've, and, I've and I wonder is, about that because when we talk about Antifa in the U.S., only Republicans believe that there's some kind of real organization there because I mean, I mean there obviously no they're kind of anarchic, right? No. No, no, it's it's totally anarchic. I mean, there used to be at least one Antifa in every town in Austria because it was just like a couple of leftists uh, uh, going for beers and maybe publishing fanzines or something like that, or 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 uh, I mean, not really doing anything uh, besides mostly discussing politics or something like that. Sometimes, of course, there were like uh, like Nazi marches or something like that, and then they would organize and say like we do with the counter demonstration or something. But other than that, it was never like an organizational structure. It, I mean, it just means like anti-fascists. And I mean, <laughs> that is not an organization per se. It's just like a mindset. You know? So have you had, have you had a, a lot of, have you had a, a strong sort of fascist element that's persisted within Austria? Oh yeah! Oh yeah! Absolutely. I mean, I I remember my my first I first got smacked in the face when I was seventeen at a demonstration, the like by a Nazi. So and Yikes. I mean, I, I, yeah, <laughs> and uh, and uh, of of course that gives you a perspective on the world. <laughs> but I mean, Austria, I guess, as every big or small uh, Western country has a certain like right-wing populist movement. I would say a third of Austrian voters are right-wing populists. So, and that of course was super strong in their early nineties because this guy called Jörg Haider who became, became something like the blueprint for right-wing populist movements in Europe uh, uh, came to power. So before that, the Freedom Party was kind of like strange mixture of like outsider politicians and some Nazis, but also some liberals, kind of weird, weird concept, the Freedom Party. Mm -hmm. And the Freedom Party in 86 became the, the right-wing populist party uh, because this guy, Jörg Haider, who was a uh, super right-wing, uh, became the head of the party and he reshaped it in, in, his, uh, in, in, in his ideology. And they started getting votes. Uh, so suddenly the Freedom Party had 10% votes, 20% votes, 25% votes. And the Conservative Party and the, and the Social Democrats were super afraid, of course, by this emergence of, uh, of, of right-wing populism. And I would even say that people like Trump or people uh, in other countries really were influenced by the playbook that, that your Qaeda created to create a successful right-wing populist party. And I grew up in that, in that political like struggle. And one of the things that I saw early on that was super interesting was to see that you could organize demonstrations and things like that super easy via telecommunication infrastructures. Yeah. But uh, many leftists were not online, so they were actually afraid of it. So, and I, I kind of agree with them, and agreed with them back then. But I also said, like, hey, uh, I, I know that there is a surveillance potential in in new media and and telecommunication, but if you're too technophobic about that stuff you will leave the playing field to the others. You will leave the playing field to the conservatives. You will leave it to the libertarians and they will shape the internet in a way they want. Uh, if we as leftists and, and, and people with a different ideology are not online and create it with them or, or try to shape it in a different direction. So that's why I was super early on and very adamant of saying like, hey, don't be too conservative about that. Get an email address, get a website, uh, be on the file net, be on whatever network there is and use it. It's a tool. Uh, and tools are, of course, never neutral. I know that. And I knew that back then. But, but just like leaving it to the others, I thought would be the wrong thing to do. Yeah, I mean, so, I yeah. think we both found that there was a strong 
a very strong potential to build collaboration using internet tools. But at the same time, there was uh, a potential which I don't think that, I'll just speak for myself, I think I was naive about this. I didn't think about the extent to which the internet could be manipulated and people could be manipulated through internet messaging. So while we could build great collaborations, it was also possible to build really terrible uh, movements built around sort of weird ideological uh, conspirator conspiratorial yeah. movements. Yeah, yeah. I'm thinking about like Pepper QAnon and that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah I think there was. I, I, totally, I totally agree. I think some of that is because there were not. I mean, I, I'm not sure. I would. I would want it to be quoted like in a in, in a in an academic paper or something like that. But I think it might be an interesting. Uh, idea for a study of some kind or maybe going into the archives and, and reading up on it but i think part of why the internet is like it is today is because certain elements of the political sphere and certain people ignored it for such a long time until the point came when it was already shaped in a way and used in a way that became toxic let, let's call it that way or or where where something like the like Web 2.0 happened, and there is nothing inherently bad about Web 2.0, but the way how it was implemented, the way what companies uh, created the structures, made it incredibly uh, bad. I mean, uh, I, I, I'm not saying a platform like Facebook is is the devil, <laughs> but it is the devil if it has a certain it, so. It, it, it is a tool that would work perfectly as one of many tools in, in a toolkit, and you kind of like use the tools that you have at your disposal. But Facebook and all the big players, they became the entire tool set. And if people associate Facebook with the internet in a certain way, like, you know, like if you go to a shopping mall nowadays and you say you go to the computer store, what people mean is the Apple store, you know? Because they don't even know that there is a world beyond Apple. It's just yeah, I like used to, I used to take a like an image of the TCP/IP stack and put Facebook on top of that, just like seeing Facebook as sort of like ultimately the top of the stack and the way people experience the internet. And that that turned out to be prophetic. That's kind of the way yeah. it happened. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, and the I internet think, turned out to be a problem for me just now because I got dropped off of our conversation thanks to Speculum Cable. Yeah, well, it's Spectrum Cable, but my Spectrum wife calls cable. it Speculum Cable because they're <laughs> rather they're rather intrusive. And Spectrum, I'm out in, yeah, you know, I'm in a, out in a forest community here, and uh, we have a choice of. Uh, you know, one internet provider, that's it. <laughs> and if you don't like it, then you can go and try one of the satellite providers, which is yeah. equally shitty. And <laughs> it's just become a, a, a nightmare. You know, social media, the big social media companies in this country are uh, under scrutiny right now because they've re been revealed to have a lot of sketchy things going on in their ways that they uh, deal with people's personal data and with the security and with the uh, the stuff John was talking about, you know, just the the evil stuff that gets spread through social media and there's not anyone out there trying to stop some of it. Yeah, I mean, the question is always uh, like, like, what, what should you tolerate? You know, like the what, what's the bounder, boundary of, of, of tolerance? And I mean, that's what the the right wingers, the QAnons, and all of that stuff—they're—they're they're doing an excellent job at at kind of like building this like uh, strange uh, liberty, free speech, uh, like Death Star force field around them, and trying to immune, immunize uh, uh, themselves against any kind of. Uh, critique, control, however, however you call it. Because the very moment 
you you criticize something uh or you say like this is like beyond what what a civil discourse should be in the media sphere they say like no we're being censored or something like that and uh but it's it's but but they're using the concept of censorship because most of the time it's not censorship they're using the concept of censorship uh as this like boogeyman to to weaponizing to it yeah. yeah it's weaponizing it yes exactly yeah i the interesting thing is that there's actually a few fair there's not too many of those people they're a minority for sure um, sometimes it looks like half the people in the U.S. have bought into that stuff <clears throat> because it kind of looks like half the people in the U.S. are Republicans. But I don't think that's really true even. I, Republicans and Democrats are both minorities. Uh, and in fact, there's more Democrats than there are Republicans. Uh, and the Republican Party, Party has been hijacked to a great extent by these people. But I think what the problem is is that they're loud. They have a high volume and they're getting a lot of coverage because it's dramatic. There's a lot of drama there. And they're using that to sell their way into people's heads yeah. very effectively. You know, even people who don't agree with them Start are, it, are yeah. affected by them. Yeah. It's interesting because I think it is a very peculiar and interesting and also very American problem because i mean i have to say uh uh the trump playbook the whole fake news things and all that stuff that also arrived in europe but it is uh, not as effective in europe and in the european media sphere as in the us and i think one of the main reasons for that is that in the us especially with this like very polarized you know like republicans versus democrats kind of thing like in austria for example we have six or seven parties and there is always to get uh to, to get a functioning government you have to form coalitions and the very moment two or three parties have to work together there is debate there is compromise in in the us it's like a winner takes it all kind of thing between between and it's always like us versus them there is like in, from game theory we know the very moment a third player is in the game like the moves and the motivations uh of the big players or of the other players change and and that's that's never happening in the u.s yeah i follow Absolutely. the news from uh from europe and uh, other countries that outside of the united states and it seems the proliferation of political parties in those countries has been a benefit to their politics because they are pretty much forced to have uh, compromise yeah. and consolidation of their interest because you know here you're either democrat or republican if you announce yourself as independent people laugh like oh well they, yeah, yeah. They, they'll go away <laughs> and they usually do. like 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 jello biafra who ran for like the green party as the presidential <laughs> candidate sometime or something well he, he yeah, was you know, he was my candidate when yeah, i was yeah, living yeah. in the bay area because uh, jello is a good friend of mine i i really <laughs> i really love him and uh and yeah but it's it's more like a publicity stunt it's like it's like doing something to 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 critique the system you know like how is this even possible that that we can really only change like choose between uh two sides of the same coin and i'm not saying that that i would say it's strange but most of the the difference between the republicans and the democrats in most points aren't that big uh so but well it, it used to be anyway yeah, yeah yeah it used to be anyway i it is, uh, i mean they're they're both dependent to a certain degree on 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 campaign money and, and and corporate structures and lobbyists and stuff like that so that's true for both parties but that's also in general the, the, the problem of the american system and but what i what i really think is like really getting us into into a, a shit ton of problems is that the american political discourse like the the, the 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 mass media political discourse is treating uh opinions as like a marketable product as news so, yeah so they're, so they're they're blurring the line between news and opinion ex exactly 
So the opinion, so so it, like, 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 let, let's take like a, a very popular one, like the whole abortion debate, yeah? Uh, you take the abortion debate, you and, and you take it and you market it like a product, and then you try to sell it as part of the mass media debate about politics. This is exactly or, what they've done, by the way. I mean, yeah. they were looking for an issue that they thought could be polarizing in the right way, and they picked abortion and they started banging away at abortion like for years. Exactly. And now it's and like science, the dog who like caught the car. Science. Now what do they do about it? I mean, they got what they wanted supposedly, and actually it's kind of working against them because it turns out that most people in the U.S. are not opposed to abortion. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or, or the whole debate about like creationism and, and bullshit like that. I mean, that would never, I mean, there are many, many religious people in Europe, but but the idea that there's something like creationism or, or it should not be taught in school or or, uh, or evolution is one of many possible ways to explain the universe. I mean, that debate would never come up in, 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 uh, in Europe. And it also doesn't come up because it is not marketable. There is there like the, the political system and the mass media system works differently in Europe, and you would never get anyone be able to make it into a product to be a creationist or to be anti-science because you couldn't sell it, you know, uh, because it doesn't work that way. And uh, I find it fascinating that it is possible also by a small minority. To just like almost like a startup to create the startup of creationism as as a political product or abortion as a political product or whatever else it is or like anti-vaxxing as a political product uh, anti-vaxxers in Austria but they would never ever get that mass media attention in Austria that they get uh, in, in the U.S. just because certain uh, media system, certain um, TV stations like Fox News, etc., uh, use that as something that they can sell. Like we are the ones who talk about anti-vaxxing, you know, and then people buy it by by watching it and and supporting Fox by 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 attention and uh, therefore advertisement money. I've always been a news junkie, obvious from my name, Scoop. I started out in uh, as a news reporter on radio, and I've always kept up with it. And I've noticed the the whole point about marketing, the cable news especially is run like a marketing campaign. It, well, whatever the big story is, they ignore the rest of the world and. And they're like the attention span of a cat. If you ever had a cat, they'll focus on one thing and just go for it, you know, until the, someone takes it away. And that's what the news uh, staff at the, the cable news networks are doing. They'll get the one that they think is going to draw the most eyeballs and sell the most product, and they'll just beat it to death until something else comes along, and they'll switch to that subject. Yeah, it's like throwing shit to the wall and... Uh... And, and looking what sticks, but also exactly. pointing with a laser pointer on it all the time. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I again think it's quite a bit about money. And one of the political problems that we have in the U.S. is that we currently don't have as many people signing up to do, like to run for office in order to be a public servant. They're running for office in order to get a paycheck and maybe some power, you know, and some attention. Uh, and maybe someday they can write a book about it. Yeah. And they're not doing the work of governance. Yeah. And I mean, that could be said about also many politicians in Europe. I think it is like what kind of what 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 kind of leeway do they get? Or what 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 like how how can they, like in a negative way, hack the system? Uh, how can they take so much out of f for their personal gain? Because, for example, in Austria, there's just like certain limits. You cannot earn more money than X 
uh, as a politician, there's just like there's a there's a glass ceiling, you know, and uh, I don't know. Well, in the U.S. right now, we have Joe Biden as our president, and he's a very traditional politician. He's been in it for for forever, and he's really a public servant. You know, he's one of those people. And he has been getting a lot of shit done since he was elected president. He's not like sitting in the Oval Office with nine television sets blaring and tweeting his ass off. He's actually working the system to try to help people. And the, the question has been whether the right or the Republicans or whatever you want to call them, the Trumpists, whether they have... Uh, sufficient power to distract from the actual effectiveness of the Biden administration and whether they will somehow be able to cast that in such a bad light, you know, through yeah. just, you know, the propaganda, et cetera, yeah. um, that they can defeat him. And also just incidentally to that, they're, trying to seize the mechanism of voting so that they can control the counting of votes. And there's actually an argument now that's becoming really popular within the Republican Party that voters should not pick the president. Legislatures should pick the president, or at least legislators should pick the electors, and that the vote should have uh, a diminished uh, weight in the decision about who is president. And that all comes from the fact that Joe Biden beat Donald Trump and Donald Trump couldn't believe it. You know, he couldn't believe that he could have lost yeah, and lost to Joe Biden. Yeah. So he's trying to steal the election back, basically. Yeah. And and he's not going to succeed in stealing the 2020 election back, but he'll do a damn hard. Uh, he'll work hard at uh, stealing the 2024 election if if he's actually nominated. Which yeah. looks pretty likely right now. It's, I mean, that's the whole problem with the kind of like the attention economy of, of something like that. Because even if it is something that is critical about Trump, you know, like the whole January 6th uh, telecast and, and uh, the whole thing about now about the documents at Mar a Lago. All that stuff is, of course, critical of Trump, and uh, and rightly so. People are reporting about it, but at the same time, it is also give him, giving him again a lot of uh, airplay, you know. And he's he's back in the focus, and he's back in the debate. And the one thing that we need is just like not talking about Trump. Like Trump has to finally, kind of like as a concept has to be laid to rest, you know? <laughs> but of course that doesn't work because the very, but, but you have, there, there's no other way. Like it's, it's, you can, you cannot make it right. If you talk about him, if you criticize him and rightly so you give him power. Uh, uh, and there's no way not talking about him. It's just like, it's just like superpower. <laughs> Yeah, the problem with running for office in this country is a lot of the people who would probably be really good, really <laughs> smart, really uh, you know, game changers are avoiding running for office because they've seen what happens to people who get into office. And it, you know, it's like being an embattled nation all of a sudden. You're, you're surrounded by crazy people who want to do you in. I mean, literally and physically do you in. And that's uh, a big discouragement for anybody with any kind of talent or good uh, political ideas. You know, they're, they're, they don't want to get involved. Yeah. I mean, it's like uh, as a good old leftist, I always am struggling with, like how how do we deal? What what is governance? How should it work? How should it how should it look like? And there is a difference. For example, the democracy in the U.S. is different than the democracy we have in Austria because we have a different form of voting. Or in the, or in Germany, in Germany, for example, the chancellor is the important person that you vote for, like comparable to the president in the U.S. Uh, and the Germans are not voting for the president. The president is voted by by the parliament. 
So you don't directly vote for the president in uh, in Germany. In Austria, we vote for the president and we also vote for the uh, for the chancellor. But the chancellor is the person that is important and not the president. The president is more like a figure representational head. figure. It's almost like the yeah. queen of some or, 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 or something like that. So and even if you compare all the different forms of democracies, they are different. And and then there is the the, the general question is like. Should all things in governance be run by votes? For example, I mean, if you would send someone to Mars, it would be completely stupid to have an election process decide who flies to Mars. No, it is a peer, it's a peer review thing. Like uh, the person who is who's best doing the job is getting into the capsule and doing that and you wouldn't vote for who is your favorite botanist or something like that. No, it's it's, it's absurd. Yeah. Yeah, it's, um, it, I've had a pro that problem with democracy for years. It's been hard to reconcile. But I always remind myself of what Winston Churchill said. You know, that democracy is the worst form of government in the world, except for all the others. Yeah, the problem with 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 democracy is always uh, that that it has a tendency of of embracing certain forms of fascism because because most of the big fascist movements in in, in the 20th century were voted in you know, like yeah populist like, movements yeah exactly. exactly so like how how do you control that populist element within a democracy and and my 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 opinion would be that certain things are just like off the vote about certain things there should not be like a voting process about certain things if if uh, if there is uh, if, if there's a scientific consensus about x uh, they, 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 no one needs to vote about anything anymore like just like let's get it done you know yeah uh, yeah well i realize that you know trump is sort of like a product of this change that they made many years ago to get away from the parties picking their nominees and instead have the voters pick the nominees in primary elections. So that was a more democratic way of doing things to actually have the nominees selected by the voters. But it meant that voters could be manipulated to pick somebody who was really not a good choice yeah basically yeah. um i mean there's been a lot of game in the system here i yeah, we yeah, could go on about this for hours but i really yeah. want to talk about uh you're coming to austin for one oh, thing yeah, absolutely yeah, and yeah. uh and uh you're going to be at fantastic fest for the second year in a row right or have you been there yeah. more than that i can't i can't <laughs> believe that happened so because last year uh i was there it was it was a special year because there were not that many guests it was still i only could get into the country because i had a special visa uh to get into the country because it was still uh within the the presidential uh, travel ban uh time frame so so i was one of the few europeans at, at fantastic fest last year but it was it was super special because it was my first time at fantastic fest and it was my first uh, like horror feature film I had uh, world premiere at Fantastic Fest, so it was super. And it was also good meeting people. I think one of the reasons why I'm back at Fantastic Fest, especially doing the opening party and bringing some cocktail robots, is because uh, I had a lot of time to talk to the organizers there, especially also Tim Leake. Uh, who is running Alamo Draft House, uh, the founder of Alamo Draft House, and, and Lisa Dreyer, uh, who is now the head of Fantastic Fest. And, and like in one of those conversations, I dropped that, like they, they were assuming that I'm like one of the many people who are filmmakers and, uh, and do filmmaking. And I said like, well, I'm not only a filmmaker, I do many, many things. And most of the things I do are actually not filmmaking. Uh, like if you see statistically, uh, I, I do way more crazy art projects uh, than 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 feature films, and then I I dropped that 
the, the story that I'm doing a cocktail robot festival for almost 25 years in, in Austria. And they were like, what the fuck, cocktail robots? What is this? And and Tim Leake, just like a couple of weeks after Fantastic Fest, we had a Zoom call and he said, I want the cocktail robots in Austin at the next Fantastic Fest for the opening night. Robo and, Exotica! Yes, exactly, Robo Exotica. And, uh, and that's happening now. So we're bringing like 10 machines from Austria and a couple from... Uh, uh, from the U.S., from friends that we that we know in the U.S., and we'll have a big opening party uh, at, at Fantastic Fest. And at the same time, that's also interesting is I'm here with my new film, so I have like two premieres at Fantastic Fest of two films in a row, and we also do the cocktail robots there. Uh, and uh, and also like a week after Fantastic Fest, um, the the streaming release uh, happens for the film I premiered at last Fantastic Fest. So, so, so did, have, didn't Draft House pick that up for distribution? It, it, exactly, exactly. Draft House is showing it for one week at at all of their uh, Draft House uh, theaters. So and that's have, Masking Threshold, right? That's Masking Threshold. Yes, that's the film that I I premiered last year, and an Alamo. Uh, uh, bought it so so uh alamo draft house films uh is is releasing it and it's uh actually a theatrical release so it will be in the cinemas for like a week and i'm really hoping you can get me into the academy awards next year <laughs> it, it is true <laughs> now that i have a theatrical release i'm technically nominated i like that nominated but i am i'm on the list the eligible so. yeah it will it will not it will not will it will not help me with this film <laughs> but but yeah well, so and, given yeah. your background it's a it seems a little weird to me you are making horror movies yeah. well i mean it's I, I i made now two horror films in a row and i have to say like the first one masking threshold from last year is uh is uh a very experimental horror film and the new one is also experimental but in a different way and uh, the two films I made before that were two documentaries. One was about nerd culture, kind of like a road trip about nerds, uh, like where I was going through the U.S. and, and visiting different and different interviewing people. weirdos like like yourself, like me, yeah. And 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 Bruce Sterling, how is Bruce doing, by the way? I think he's doing great. He's okay. kind of a grandfather now. Oh wow. In Italy, I suppose. No, no, they're in uh, they're in Spain. They're in Ibiza. In Spain. Oh, nice. Yeah. Nice. So, so I did this documentary about nerds and nerd culture, and the next one was a documentary about politics, uh, called "Glossary of Broken Dreams," where I try to explain certain topics and themes that people like to use all the time on Facebook. You know, like people talk about capitalism and resistance and surveillance and privacy but most of the time i have the feeling that they don't know what they're talking about so i made this almost like a sesame street like 98 minute documentary where i try to explain certain concepts and why i think some of them are still important and some were probably lost uh but that were the two films before that and now i made two horror films in a row which is uh, strange, but I mean, I have to say I like horror films because if you look back in the history of filmmaking, horror films were always were a very early in adopting interesting like aesthetic techniques or 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 they like horror films were always very creative uh, or 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 did things that then became. Uh, like aesthetic, like tropes or things in other uh, formats, but but the horror films did it first. For example, if you think about all this, like the expressionism in something like Nosferatu, where they use the the, the space and the and the and, and and the landscape and, and and the rooms in a very strange way, in this like expressionistic way, and that was the first time in a horror film they did that, or or. Uh, something like Alien, for example, where you have this like very claustrophobic, techno critical view of the world and corporations, and that's also something that that uh, was first established in a in a horror film. So so horror films are 
are aesthetically always very interesting and very avant-garde. But at the same time, most horror films on the narrative, from a narrative perspective, from a narration perspective, are kind of like a repeating of the same thing over and over again or trying to make the most of a story that has been told already a million times. So for me, that is fascinating, that it's it's a very experimental and aesthetically uh, interesting genre, but at the same time, it's the same stories all over again. Uh, and nobody's complaining about it. It's just, that's, that's how it is. And, well, and there's, uh, there's all sorts of things you can do in the context of telling that story too, that could be unique, but... With Rasenest, which is your new film, uh-huh. w- one thing I found was really unique is just kind of the approach you took of it's like a, a DVD voiceover, you know, one of those voiceovers that you can run on a DVD when when you're watching it, where the director is kind of talking about his thing. And you've taken and that's the narration. Yes. Yeah. You've taken that narration and done something interesting with it. I don't really want to get too much into what you did with it. But I found it pretty fascinating. I yeah, did have a favorite, thank you so much. a favorite quote, which was, "You can't put the shit back in the muskrat." Yes. <laughs> so you wrote, you wrote the thing, I wrote uh, the it, whole yeah. uh, script. Uh, what inspired you to to write this particular film? Okay, so the backstory is that. A friend of mine uh, that I met at Fantastic Fest, uh, uh, Eric MacGyver, uh, last year, uh, he he made a, a really fun, uh, nerdy film called uh, The Ike Boys. It's it's his love letter to Japanese films and manga and stuff like that. So, and I, I really like the guy, and we invited him over to to Austria uh, to be our artist in residence uh, in Vienna. And uh, we had a conversation and he asked me, so can you tell me like, what are the like the 10 or 20 films from Austria of the last 20 years that I should watch? And then I made this list. And when I made this list, I had this feeling of like, oh, wow, interesting. They're all important films, but at least a third of them I actually hate. They're super important. You have to watch them, but I don't like them. Yeah, And one of those films, is a film called uh, Homo Sapiens. It's by a filmmaker called uh, Nicholas Geierhalter. And uh, the film is pretty much uh, like a hardcore art house film. Uh, I think it won even an award in Cannes or something like that. But I remember watching it in a cinema in Austria and thinking of like, oh my, what is this? What is this? And, And imagine that the film is a film about rundown places all over the planet you know like a, a rundown alleyway in fukushima a rundown shopping mall in minneapolis where where like stuff is already growing so it's kind of like it's kind of like a a film about rundown places but there's no movement there are no people nothing it's just like sometimes one minute shots of like water dripping through the uh, the roof of a rundown shopping mall or something like that and then, you know, like a pigeon flies by and people start clapping in the audience because something moved, you know, <laughs> it's, it's almost like coffee, like a coffee table book of destruction, uh, but as a 90 minute feature film. And when I watched it, I couldn't believe like how strangely fascinating, but also super boring that film was. And, and it's kind of like, and I, 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 it reminded me when I made that list for my friend that this was a super popular film at film festivals. But, but oh my God, this, this kind of art house film is, is not for me. And uh, I had another conversation with another friend where I talked about the 30 years war, uh, which is kind of like a, a super interesting uh, part of European history because not many people know about it. But it kind of shaped the the entire history of Europe and maybe of the entire world after it happened. And, uh, for example, it gave us the concept of the nation state. We wouldn't have nation states and diplomacy 
if there wouldn't have been this 30 years war and it's like enormous atrocities. There are some people who say it was more atrocious and more bloody than even the Second World War, uh, just by the statistics of how many people that lived in that area in Europe and then died because of the war. Uh, and so that that's so I had a conversation with a friend of mine about that. And and also that in the area where I grew up that I mentioned before, Schokarau, uh, there are a couple of local, you know, like um, like statues or or things that remind people of the 30 years war, but are not like people, but people walk by and don't pay attention to it. And I think I put all of that stuff together in my mind. And then in, in January of this year, this idea of like an art house film I hate or, or, or I, or I kind of like dislike and the idea to maybe do something about the 30 years war. And uh, another idea uh, that a friend of mine told me about an audio play that he wanted to make. And I kind of like put all of that stuff together and it became Rat's Nest. So, and, and you're right, I probably shouldn't spoil too much, but, but it's almost like two films at once. And at the same time, it's also not a film. It is, it is, uh, and if I explain it to people, it takes me five minutes to talk about it. But if people watch it, it's very clear what the film is going to be just after like a, a minute or something like that, I hope. Uh, and, and, and people hopefully get the concept and, and, and go with the flow and, and, and watch it. But it's, uh, it's at the same time a satire of art house films and a satire of movie making and indie filmmaking and indie film funding and all that stuff. But it's also in a certain way a love letter to genre films. But it's also a satire of genre films. But it's also a love letter to, to art house films. But it's also a satire of art house films. So it's, uh, it's all of that together. I hope I make sense. I'm not sure. <laughs> what do you think? Yeah, I was uh, impressed by the fact that you concentrated on the Thirty Years' War. I studied you know, European history in college and always found it fascinating. But all the whole idea of religious warfare is uh, talk about horror films. If you look at any uh, of the religious wars, like you know the Templars, or the Crusaders going you know to take back the Holy Land or the Spanish Inquisition. It's like, in the name of religion, some of the most horrifying crimes against humanity have occurred. Yeah, yeah absolutely, absolutely. And, uh, and I mean, the, the whole 30 years war uh, started as a religious conflict, of course, and, and, it, and it stayed a religious conflict until the very end, but also because religion was so ingrained into the political system that you have some countries that are Protestants, some countries that are or, 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 or Reichs that are Catholic, and and of course they were all looking for 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 a reason to to eliminate each other or or get their hands on on their uh, on their lands. Uh, of course they they would then base the entire uh, struggle on religion. So I mean it's kind of hard to differentiate between what was religion and what was politics back then because it was pretty much the same thing but it's so bizarre for me that something like catholicism and protestantism that is very close to it like i mean the only difference is that the that the protestants got rid of the internal hierarchical structures uh and and made it more like free floating you know but but that something that could be so close could be the reason for so much difference and so much hatred and so much bloodshed and so much pillaging and raping and I mean it, incredible yeah. yeah and the way each of those like religious um, I don't know communities uh, sort of demonized the other you know and that uh, that was you brought that out very well uh, later in the film but it seemed to me, uh, as I was watching it at first, it, it felt for a while like the imagery, I mean, there's kind of a montage of, of, of images, uh, and it seemed that the narration kept drifting away from that. I mean, the focus of the narration tended to 
drift away from the film and the, the filmmaker in the narration uh, would get a little aggravated with that. <clears throat> but that as, as, as the film goes on, the, uh, the narration seems to be synced more and more with the imagery. That, am I reading yes, that yes. correctly? Is that yeah, intentional? Yeah, absolutely. I, I try to do that because in the beginning, I, I wanted, because it's kind of like a satire of like pretentious art house films. So I thought like it should, if, if people like in, in, in the first like third of the movie or something like that, uh, it is pretty much not that relevant what you see because the joke is almost like uh, the, the interviewer for the DVD commentary asks the director who is also kind of like an asshole character and I really like writing him. Uh, she's asking, hey, all the stuff that you're talking about, I don't, I don't see that in the film, you know, like it, it is so fascinating to talk about all of that stuff, but I wouldn't know that if I would see the film. And he's, of course, completely upset about that and like, ah, do, do you want me to be like, uh, uh, like, like a, a prostitute or something? And like, sh should I, should I just like, you know, like he's, he's, he's. I'm, I'm trying to make fun about the idea that, that certain films, although they pretend that that they can be deciphered without help, there is no way of deciphering that. So there, there are some films that you need external context. To understand it and in that film I, I put that to the extreme so in the beginning of the film it's just like weird random images of of of, of villages and stuff like that and nothing is somewhat related to the 30 years war besides a couple of like christian crosses or something like that but i i, I kind of like intentionally built it that way because what i wanted to do is like i wanted to kind of like establish almost like a visual grammar in the first third of the film or half of the film that then I could kind of like go back to in the second half of the film when when the narration kind of like speeds up and when when the DVD commentary becomes something else and I'm not telling yes. you what it becomes but, exactly but, but but I wanted to I, I wanted to to kind of like kind of introduce the audience to a certain way that the film feels or like the elements mm -hmm. it has and then kind of like use those elements and 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 help underscore uh like like the the story that is happening on the on, on the audio level. yeah it struck me that probably one of your biggest challenges was getting that synchronization as as the film goes on the synchronization of the images with with what's happening with the audio um I mean that that's very skillfully done, and it looks like I I can just imagine how much effort it took for you to kind of get that just right. Yeah, because I wanted it still because it is a DVD commentary about a film. So so the film, like in that, of course, in the in the universe of the story, there is a film, and it is done, and it looks like that, and people could watch it without the audio commentary track, and it would still be a working strange art house film you know and and then if you put the audio commentary on on top of it uh there is suddenly like a correlation between the audio commentary and the film and i never completely wanted so i want one i didn't want to be too obvious about it i i still wanted it it could be that it's just a coincidence that the film looks like that and the audio commentary and what's happening in the audio commentary story is matching with it in the end. Uh, it could also be, I mean, there are a couple of explanations that I kind of like crafted into the film. So for example, there is this, this moment where, where they are talking about the editing of the film and uh, the director says that sometimes, like because he edited the film, uh, as he says, like sometimes, you know, like it's almost like the film tells me how it wants to be edited. So it could also be that when he edited the film, he almost had like a premonition of some kind, what would later happen. Uh, so there could even be an explanation why there's a synchronicity between the audio level and the video level, but it's never fully explained. And it's also, I guess, not really necessary. Well, it's surreal. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. That was so great. I, 
I really enjoyed watching the film. And, and uh, one thing that struck me was that you managed to get Joe Dante to do, um, to do some something. commentary at the end. I, I was so happy. A friend of mine knows him and he interviewed him for like, uh, like this online um, video show he's doing. And, uh, and I asked him, so, hey, uh, would it be possible to ask Joe Dante to get in contact with me? Could you send him an email? And Joe Dante really sent me an email and we had a 45 minute uh, Zoom call and I explained him the story and he really liked it. He th thought that it's kind of crazy, but a strange idea and he wanted to be part of it. And then my, my co-producer from LA, uh, she like uh, Julianne Gabbard, uh, she, uh, she met him in LA in a sound studio for probably like 10 minutes. Uh, and he recorded uh, a couple of lines for the film because he's the narrator of, of that pretentious art house film <laughs> in the end of the film. And I was so happy, so happy. That, oh, that was so, great. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So well, and it was really not a lot of work for it because I mean, it was really like 10 minutes in the sound studio, you know. I think we're running out of time. Scoop, did you have something else? No, I think uh, we covered a lot. Uh we did cover a lot of ground today. Oh yeah, absolutely. And interestingly, it's all related because even in the beginning, we talked about you know, like Austria and, and Austrian politics. And of course that also is part to a certain degree mm -hmm. of, of, of Rot's Nest and, and, uh, and, and, and the history of Austria. And uh, in, in general, also the story of like, where are we going with our democracy? Uh, like the only thing that I know is like we should not go back to the point where we have something like the 30 years war where just because there is no separation of state and church suddenly something like that happens and kills millions of people and uh, I mean yeah like I mean there's there's no way talking about the present without talking about the past so yeah it's kind of interesting that you know it's important to acknowledge history and to understand what happened before, but it's also important to understand that we're in such a different place now than, yeah. I mean, humans have never been in quite the same place that they're in now. And actually things have been going very well for us. And yeah. we're very dissatisfied with that. There's a lot of grievance about the fact that things are going so well. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah absolutely. absolutely. Crazy time. Yeah. Crazy well, time. Crazy time. Thanks yeah. so much. And I hope to see you next week. Ab absolutely. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to, to the premiere of Rod's Nest at, uh, at Fantastic Fest. I'm, I'm, I'm honestly really, really, uh, like not anxious, but, but I have not read a single review of Rod's Nest yet. And it's a strange film and it's not your classic horror film. And the horror film community sometimes can be conservative. So I wonder how many like bad reviews I will get because it's not your standard like Halloween splat uh, splatter film or slasher. I found some reviews of it. There is like there's uh, they there's liked one, it. There's there's one you found it oh on Letterbox it's interesting I don't there's know there's two are, or three but, reviews out there. Yeah, there there are a couple of reviews on Letterbox and there's one guy who says he said he saw it as part of the film festival jury. And he's not giving away anything, but he just wrote that he liked it. So that is super. But I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing some really like actually like journalistic reviews uh, and, and, and reviews on, on, on media platforms because there hasn't been a single one out yet. And uh, well, what can I say? Knock on wood. I mean, I'm very happy with it. It is, it is what I wanted it to be. If people don't like it, what can I say? I don't know. I need to watch them. Academy Award material, man. Yeah, or at least the, the MTV Movie Award. Yeah, just tell the haters to tune in to the Disney Channel or something. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thanks so much. Absolutely. It's and time. I oh, yeah, by the way, talking about like the, the, the <laughs> like there's the, there's the guy. I saw him. Yeah. I've been it's watching him. Yeah. He's, he was just sitting there. He's being really quiet. Quiet. He's like a bobblehead. So he's usually he's not that quiet. And that's and that hat, that's a Soviet hat, and it's the Soviet hat I wore at the Plutopia. At the Plutopia, the event. first Plutopia event. Yes, I think that was the first one. Yeah. Oh man. Cool. Oh man. Anyhow, look. Let, let's cut it. <laughs> Next time. Okay. I Go will talk to you soon.
Absolutely. And we'll so do much, this guys. again. Yay! We do it. You can follow the Plutopia News Network at Plutopia.io. On Facebook, go to at Plutopia News. On Twitter, it's at Plutopia. With John Lubkowski, I'm Scoop Sweeney. This is the Plutopia News Network. 20 minutes into the future.